Good evening. It's good to see everyone. Yeah, I uh, thank you, Warren. That was beautiful worship team. Thank you. Let's give them another hand. That was beautiful. Um, I, uh, I also want just to give a, a, another plug. We're about a month out from the launch of Acts School of Ministry. We're really excited, and we're, we were really excited about running in this season. We really feel like the Lord is marking January, and it's going to be the birth of a fresh wave in our community. And so we want to invite you. We still got a month. If you've been on the fence, we want to push you over. Come on over. Jump in with us. And uh, I, it's what I've been dreaming about for a long time. So we're going to be running together hard. It's going to be amazing. So if you guys, we have, I think, some of those little postcards maybe around here in the back. They'll be out there in the back. Pick one up, pray it through, and then come join us. We'd love to see you. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your presence here. Father, we just pray right now that you would open up our eyes and open up our hearts. God, I pray that you would touch us with spiritual hunger. I pray, God, that we would, uh, in the same way we, we lean in and worship, we would pull on the word. God, I pray that you would teach us how to pull on the word. I pray for that spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. We ask you to give that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Well, I want to seek to, well, first off, I, I absolutely have listened to Brian's message from last week at least two times, two and a half. And I, I just want to encourage you, Matthew 24 and 25, and what he walked through was absolutely brilliant. You guys listen to that, feed on that. And I, I want to seek to go after three things tonight. I'm going to try to weave together three big, three, three big themes, Christmas, Holy Spirit, and Maranatha. All right, Christmas, Holy Spirit, and Maranatha. And I, I love it. And I, I just want to take a little bit of the first time just to talk about the Christmas season because I've just really, it's all I've been really living in over the last few weeks, more than just Christmas, but just getting absolutely undone with the faithfulness of God to his word and his promises. That he doesn't make empty promises, but that he made a promise. I, I, I love to think of it in the very beginning in Genesis 3. You know, right at the beginning, they've done messed it up two chapters into the Bible, three chapters in. You know, we just get going and they've done messed it up. And the famous reality, the Lord walks into the garden and he begins to kind of release judgments to each company. And I love it because in Genesis 3.15, we really see the first gospel proclaimed in the word of God, at the darkest moment, the Lord looks and he goes, okay, Satan, you won round one, all right? You won round one, but I want you to look at this little girl, Eve, because there's going to come a seed out of this woman, and that seed is going to crush your head. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. And from the very beginning in the garden, there is the prophecy of a seed that would come, a seed that would deliver that would restore, and that would reverse the curse of what had just happened in the garden, that there was coming a man that was going to reverse the curse and restore order, as God called it. There you have it, Genesis 3. And now, the whole, I love the whole story of the Word of God. The enemy has crept in over these last years trying to divide the old and the new. Guys, it's one glorious story. So we get to follow throughout the whole Old Testament the tracing of the seed, the tracing of this deliverer who would come. And in Genesis 11, we get to see mankind's greatest attempt to make a name for themselves. And we see Babel as this city was being built to do more than just build a high city, but they were actually invoking the demonic realm. They were invoking the demonic realm to come in so that humanity could flex and take on God. That's really what's going on in Genesis 11. Well, we know what, what God did. God goes, let's come down and let's confuse their languages and let's scatter them. And that's what you see happen in Genesis 11 is the scattering of the nations through the languages. And now the question stands, how is God going to redeem the nations? How is God going to save the nations, the nations that just got scattered? How is he going to save them? And we move right into Genesis chapter 12, and God calls this man, Abram, out of the Ur of the Chaldeans, and he says, I'm going to make you, he goes, I'm going to give you a land, Abram, 
I'm going to make you a great nation, a righteous nation, and I want you to know that in you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And we see the tracing of the promises made to Abraham and to his seed, and the seed being Christ Jesus. That there was coming a uh, uh, the, the, the promises made to this man that would be the birthing of the nation of Israel that would carry it as Abraham passed it on to Isaac, to Jacob, to the 12 tribes. And what you get to see with the, the birth of the nation of Israel is that the nation is carrying a holy seed. A whole nation is carrying a promise. I love to look at I, mean, I, I want you to understand that. That's one of the great things of why my heart gets deeply touched by Israel is because of the absolute rage of Satan they've had to endure to carry forth the promised seed. Through all the generations, Revelation 12 gives us a really prophetic, symbolic picture, but you see the woman, the faithful remnant of Israel, and then you see the dragon seeking to devour the child as soon as it was born. And that's what you see happening through a whole story of Israel. And we get to see that Jacob himself in Genesis 49 is prophesying over each one of his sons. And he gets to Judah. And he says that this seed, this promised deliverer is also going to be a king. And that the scepter will not depart from Judah. We know that the, the deliverer, the, the, the seed that's coming is a king. And he's a deliverer. And we get to see the, the playing out of that and when the Lord found a man after his own heart, David, that, that one from Bethlehem who becomes king over all of Israel. And in 2 Samuel 7, he wants to build God a house. And this, this thing so moved God that David wanted to build God a house. God flipped the script on him and says, you know what, I'm going to build you a house. And your throne and your house is going to live forever. And I want you to know that the promise is to you and to your seed. In the near it was Solomon, but in the ultimate it's Jesus. The prophets will pick up on this Davidic king that's coming. Prophets like Isaiah would blow our minds with revelations of the virgin. In Isaiah 7 that would give birth and it would give birth to Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah chapter 9, unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Whew. Guys, it's, I mean, like, we know it looking back. This is Isaiah 600 years before seeing the birthing of the child. He's seeing the birthing of the child, and he's seeing the Davidic king that's coming. That's going to restore everything, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. There's coming a king, Israel. There's coming a king, nations, that's going to bring peace on the earth. That's going to abolish death and restore divine order, and reverse the curse, and deliver Israel from her loneliness and her exile. And the, and the prophecies are coming. Isaiah talked about the branch of the Lord, the one that would come through the Davidic line. Jeremiah talked about the branch of the Lord, the one that was coming that would rule in righteousness. Oh, he's coming, and he's coming, and Micah would blow our minds with you, Bethlehem, though you're the smallest of the tribes of Israel, out of you is going to come forth the ruler whose goings forth are from everlasting. Not only we get to see that there's coming a ruler out of Bethlehem who is from eternity. And these prophets are getting their minds blown. They're like, what in the world? And they're writing it down. They go, you sure? And the Holy Spirit says, write it down. The things they're seeing. And I just, I, I want you to feel, because when I think about Christmas and I think about this whole season, I think about promises that go through many ups and downs, many sideways stories, close, close calls that could have ultimately ended in death and the seed would have been abolished. 
Many points where the rage of Satan was sitting there. Sitting there in Egypt, sitting there in Assyria and Babylon, Persia. I mean, you see Queen Esther and her before the king when the Antichrist spirit was seeking to destroy all Jews from Persia. And God raised up a woman at a strategic point to reverse the curse, to break the power of the satanic assault, and to bring forth the promise. I love, it. I love Christmas because many of us have heard promises from God. We've received promises that have been many years in the making and it's been painful when you even dream about the promises God has made and it feels so far from ever happening. Guys, I want you to take heart when we read the story and when we, when we marinate in this season that our God is a faithful God. Our God is... He fulfills his promises. And with God, all things are possible. Israel's been under oppression from Babylon to Persia to Greece to Rome. Under oppression. 400 years of prophetic silence from Malachi. There's been silence. There's been deadness. I want some of you to know when it's your darkest hour, I want you to know that God's moving in the darkest hours. And God loves to intervene with his light in the darkest hours. That's why my favorite Christmas song is, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. You know, she sits in lonely exile. He's coming to deliver and he's coming to set us free. Well, I want to bring your point, I like to call two, what I call prophetic midwives to the, uh, to the stage. When I think about the Christmas story, I love all the characters, but no one moves me and really kind of speaks to what's, what, what's most marked my life other than Simeon and Anna in the temple. And I really believe that kind of spirit is on this house. God is raising this up. Can we put up Luke 2, 25? I love this. Here we go. We got Jesus and, and the parents are bringing. So, so I see all of Israel's story culminating with these two intercessors. These two people, you got to get a hold of this. These people had been in the place of prayer, fasting, gripped with the prophetic spirit before the Virgin Mary was born. And they had been gripped that something strange was happening in their generation. And I see these two as the tip of the arrow that would see the manifestation of all the prophecies. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Here it is. This man was just and devout. What was his job description, Luke? Here's what he did. He he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Have you ever thought of Jesus' name as the consolation of Israel? Now look at this, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So first we get to see that this man was anointed by the Holy Spirit to wait. This man had a supernatural anointing upon his life to tarry in the place of prayer, gripped with the prophetic spirit because the consolation of Israel was coming. I love it. And Now look at verse 26, and it had been revealed to him. How? By the Holy Spirit. We're talking about Holy Spirit. You know Holy Spirit was around before Acts 2? Y'all know that? You know Holy Spirit was around before Acts 2. Holy Spirit was brooding over the darkness in Genesis 1. Holy Spirit was upon kings and prophets and judges and would rest upon people at different times. But here we have this intercessor and Holy Spirit's on him. He was anointed with the call, anointed with the reality of waiting. And then not only that, Holy Spirit talked things to him and told him things. And look at this, verse 26. Holy Spirit revealed to him he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now time out. Holy Spirit reveals. He didn't tell him the time or the day. 
But he told him, he made a promise to him, you won't die until you lay your eyes on Emmanuel. You won't die. Do you know we would call those people fanatics, weirdos, freaks? Those people are the weird ones, the eccentric ones, the off-balance ones. And yet he lived with this prophetic reality where God spoke to him, you're not going to die until you put your eyes on the one that the prophet spoke of. Verse 27, let's keep going. I, look, I love this. Look at this, Brian. It, it says, so Holy Spirit's on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Look at this. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. Now that gives you insight. I, I think about this. Simeon's in his upper 70s, 80s. He has been gripped with this vision for so many decades he would not die till he had seen the Lord's Christ. I picture him waking up one morning. He's at his house. He's in there, maybe, you know, got, got cleaned up. He's doing his normal morning prayers. And then, and then he hears a little voice in his ear come. Get to the temple. Today's your day. Get to the temple. Today's your day. quickly throws his clothes on, runs to the temple. And guys, you got to understand, Jesus is around eight days old. They're doing the custom of the law. He's getting circumcised. He's getting, going through all the rituals that uh, a normal Jewish boy would go through. I imagine there were many eight-day-old babies in that temple. Not only was Simeon so in lockstep with the Holy Spirit, he could recognize eight-day-old Messiah. He could recognize the child and see the difference and the distinction of this child versus all the other children in the temple. He comes when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. Look at this, verse 28. He took him up in his arms and he blessed God. Look at this. And he says, Lord, now. Everybody say now. He says, now, which means this, God, I'll let you go now on it. You have been true to your word. Now, you are letting your servant depart in peace. What he's saying is, I can die now. I can die now. Think about, and I have this picture literally on my office, in my, on my table at home, is this picture of Simeon holding Jesus, holding the child, and tears streaming down his face. 60 years for one moment. 60 years with one purpose, to hold that eight-day-old baby in his arms and go, my eyes have seen your salvation. All Guys, we don't even have insight into the thousands of days of Simeon saying, did I really hear you? Did I really hear you? Did it, was it really true? Am I a little, did I miss you? All the lefts, the rights, the ups, the downs, and to put his eyes on that child and to hold that child and go, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. He says, according to your word, verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. Look at verse 32. He knew that there was coming one through Abraham and that in Abraham and his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. And the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Well, he didn't stop there. He was sitting on a prophetic word. A painful prophetic word for many decades. And the point of the prophetic word is this. Guys, there's going to be a lot of pain connected with this child. There's going to be pain. There's going to be misunderstanding. Your son is going to be a sign spoken against. And he says this, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. And for a sign which will be spoken against, yes, Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. 
And I think what he's saying is, and this is what happens many times, you get the birth of a promise and it doesn't look exactly like what you thought. You get the birth of a promise and it doesn't look like, it doesn't configure into what you thought this would look like. And what he's hitting is, he's the Messiah. He's going to be the most polarizing figure in all of history. He's going to literally split time based on his life. And I want you to know, Mary, when I see that sword piercing through her heart, I just picture the young girl at the foot of the cross watching her 33-year-old son dying at a young age. And what it all looks like is just crashing in, and it's exposing the thoughts of many hearts of a crucified Messiah. What you see, this is what I want you to see with both Simeon, and now we're going to look at Anna is that in transitional periods of history, and this is a transitional period of history, the Son of God born into the world, God taking on human flesh and being born into the world he created. The one through whom all things were made became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten, full of grace and truth, But I want you to see that in these transitional periods of history, God anoints men and women with the prophetic spirit. God anoints men and women with the grace of prayer and fasting. And he grips them with this strange confidence God's going to do something different in their generation. You feel something deep. Many of you have a deep groan on the inside of you. You can't even put language to it. But you know that you were made for greatness and that your eyes would see greatness. So we have two people the scripture highlights. But these two represent whole communities. There was one, Anna, a prophetess. The daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, and she had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. Many scholars agree that she gets married around, I don't know, 17, 18. She's married for seven years, and he dies, and she's widowed. She, we get to see it in verse 37. This, widow, this woman was a widow of about 84 years. Now look at this. She did not depart from the temple, but she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she came in that instant and she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. We get to see a whole community over here. Prayer rooms filled. When's the Redeemer coming? When are you going to bring consolation to Israel? When are you going to fulfill your promises? When are you going to break in with power? When are you going to fulfill your promises made to Abraham and David? When are you going to do it, God? See, I want you to know something. When we meditate on this season, God doesn't write hot checks. He doesn't make empty promises. It is backed by his word. It is backed by his nature. It's backed by his ability to fulfill impossible things. And what is God doing? He's anointing these two figures with the grace of prayer, grace of fasting, and a prophetic spirit. And we also see with Anna, she strengthened. She strengthened intercessors to stay in faith no matter how bad it looked. The child was born. God came to us. Emmanuel, God with us. He was born. I wish we could walk through the whole Christmas story. Guys, please get undomesticated from this story. Knock the dust off your Bibles. Knock off the weird little, you know, fairies and singing and a little bit of stuff where it's cute. It's not cute. It's so holy. It's so amazing. It's so awesome. It's so humbling. It's so supernatural. It's so supernatural. The eternal God becoming a seed in a virgin's womb. 
If you, if that doesn't make you feel the ground underneath you shaking, read it again. Read it again. The word was made flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, you need to get your mind blown by it. It needs to put you to your knees, release fresh tears, fresh wonder, and then to throw it into the mix. So many angels. They're just cute. We got all these little things. I understand we want to see little Timmy up here in the play. But guys, these are angels showing up in dreams. The Antichrist spirit is moving through Herod. Kill all the male children two years and younger. It's Revelation 12, Satan seeking to devour the child as soon as it's born. It's a real dragon seeking to kill the seed. And angels are breaking in with dreams to Joseph, the wise men, angels saying, you better get down to Egypt. You better get down to Egypt. Why? Because out of Egypt I've called my son. Fulfilling every Hebrew prophet. Fulfilling every word. Fulfilling everything. And God's moving through all of it. It's not cute. It's absolutely staggering. We need to restore worship again. Because guys, this is absolutely critical. We get this. We get this because friends... The prophets were very clear, and the prophets with the way they would prophesy, because they're seeing it dim, and they're seeing it through a glass dimly, but they will literally talk about his first coming and his second coming in a matter of one and two verses, and go in and out of them without even giving distinction. He came. What I love about Jesus is he grew. He was hidden. He was manifested at age 30. We know his life. We have the gospels. He climbed up on that tree and he was crucified for the sins of the world. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the right hand of the Father where he has been ruling for the last 2,000 years. And the same Holy Spirit that was upon Simeon and that was upon Anna. We are living in unprecedented days. A nation that was displaced for 2,000 years. Sovereignly and supernaturally placed back in their land. In 1948, then 1967, Jerusalem under her control. Supernatural events have occurred and we're in that generation where it's not just business as usual but in the same way God began to grip a prophetic company with a strange awareness God was doing something different in their generation so we're living in that same hour of human history this is what Brian spoke about last week out of Matthew 24 the signs signs in the world signs in the church Signs in the nations, signs in the Middle East, the signs that are about us, that are letting you know that something is coming. And the Holy Spirit is at full operation. The Holy Spirit is working in the global church. The Holy Spirit is purifying his bride. The Holy Spirit is delivering us of dead religion. And bringing us into intimate relationship with the Father and with the Son. The Holy Spirit is confronting status quo cultural Christianity. And is bringing us into holiness. Is bringing us into the spirit of prayer. Is awakening a love of righteousness and a hatred of wickedness. And the Holy Spirit is our wedding planner. As he's getting us ready for our wedding day. The return of our bridegroom king. Friends, this is why I wanted to take time with the first. If this season, the Christmas season, does anything in you, God does not leave not one I undotted and not one T uncrossed. But he came the first time, fulfilling everything he said he would do. And he said when they went up, the angels go, in the same way he went up, so he's coming down again. And that king 
He, he was born the first time. He's not going to be born a second time. He's coming back as a righteous king, a righteous judge. A Jewish man is going to step out of heaven and in one day is going to, is going to ultimately remove all the kings of all the nations and is going to establish his kingdom on this earth. And he's going to repopulate these nations with the righteous, with the meek, with the faithful. Holy Spirit's at work. Holy Spirit is awakening the groan. Holy Spirit. See, that, that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants us to delve this whole thing down into tongues or no tongues. This or no tongues. Guys, this thing is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. This is about the preparation of the global church for the return of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been talking about Holy Spirit. He's the guarantee. He is the preparer. Can you put Revelation twenty two seventeen up here? I think Revelation twenty two seventeen is a prophecy. It's about what we're going to look like before the Lord returns. You know why Jesus is going to come back? It's because we want him to. See, I... This is the thing that I don't think, when you look at Simeon and Anna, these two are prophetic midwives. I don't think we understand the levels of hunger and the levels of desperation in men and women that had been under tyranny. Israel had been under world domination by empires for so long. And the whole world is going to groan. God is going to use the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the greatest tribulation that the earth has ever seen to bring forth a Revelation 22, 17 people. In that verse, you see three things. Number one, the Spirit and the church are going to come into unity with one another. Number two, the church is going to operate in a bridal identity. And the church is going to be anointed with the spirit of prayer. We're going to see great presence and great pressure produce a great prayer. Great presence is coming and great pressure is coming to deliver us as believers from individualism and isolation. We're not going to live on islands anymore of saying this is how I like to do church. We're not going to live in our do denominational walls and our denominational little caves and live in our little islands. But such presence and such pressure is going to force the church into a unity with the Holy Spirit, thereby a unity with one another. Not a kumbaya unity. But that oneness that Jesus prayed for in John 17. That we would be one as the, him and the Father are one and We're going to see those Simeons and Annas. We're going to see that same spirit on the whole church. See, what we, what we celebrate in the Christmas season, what we meditate on during this month is to produce, it's to secure us in the faithfulness of his promises and it's to anchor our hope and confidence that what he said he will do, he will do. And that he's going to come again. The devil has worked overtime to steal from the body of Christ the Maranatha cry. Because when it comes to the end times, really the stuff that, are y'all with me? All right, well talk to me then, all right, good. The devil works overtime on things like you know, women in ministry, tongues, Song of Solomon, and end times. And when it comes to the end times, it's either one or two things. It's either weird Billy Bob in Arkansas trying to name the date when Jesus himself said no one knows the day or the hour. And so that does one damage 
And then the devil has deceived the whole body of Christ of thinking you need four PhDs in every language in the world to understand what the Bible has to say about the end times. So what does it leave the most normal Christian? Man, I don't even understand it. It's crazy. You got fanatics over here. You got real smart people over here. God, just make it work out. And, the, and I want you to know you're losing, I would say, the greatest revelation of Jesus in Scripture. You are losing the greatest thing that's going to set your heart on fire, produce urgency, make the practical holy, make the mundane glorious. Make your lives unto something when you understand the coming of our Lord and our Savior. The King is coming. The King is coming. The devil has us stuck down here between this side of the bird or that side, blue or red. And I want you to know the King is coming. We've lost it. And yet there's more in the Bible on the second coming of Jesus than his first coming. And you're like, brother, I just can't get my head around. I mean, Brian spoke about it last night. Jesus turning off the lights. And then Jesus manifesting out of the sky after the tribulation, coming down and all the tribes of the earth mourning as he comes to the earth and establishes his kingdom. You're like, dude, that's just too crazy for me. Yeah, about as crazy as a virgin. Holy Spirit brooding over her virgin womb. She giving birth to the Son of God. Y'all, y'all got that one down. You know why you got that down and you receive it? Because faith comes by hearing. And you have heard it so long, you have faith in it, and you believe it. Most of us, it's just cultural. You don't really know why you believe it, nor have you, nor have you been awestruck with the glory of it. God wants to knock the dust off all our cultural Christianity, of all our nice little songs and get wonder back in the church concerning his coming. Why is he coming? To deliver the world from the curse of sin, from the curse of Satan, from the spirit of darkness, and to establish his kingdom on this earth and so that we would be fully everything that God designed us to be. And he wants to anoint you with that that longing spirit for his coming. 2 Timothy 4, 8, Paul says, I'm going to get the crown of life, not me only, but all who loved his appearing. He wants to awaken the groan on the inside of you. The Bible means what it says, and it says what it means. And where there's symbols, it gives what the symbol is when it says it. It is too far gone that the church has said, oh, we'll let some other people figure that stuff out. We'll let Billy Bob out there on the mountain figure that out. Guys, the church is going to be radiant. The church is going to shine in maturity, in unity, in power. It's not The last book of the Bible is not called the revelation of Satan. It's not called the revelation of the Antichrist. We're not running around in caves and hanging out with lots of toilet paper and guns. It's a church. It's book of Acts. When you read the book of Acts, you're not mostly just locked in on the couple of chapters about the martyrdom. Yes, the devil is going to rage like no other time. But you know why he's raging? It's because the church is so on fire. It's because we've come out of cultural Christianity And we're actually walking in apostolic power and unity and glory. Why will the nations rage? Psalm 2, it says, why do the nations rage? They're declaring war on the Father and the Son. We're not even going to see atheist nations. There will be no atheists in the end times. Because the manifestation and the reality of God and His Son will be so evident through the church There will be extreme lovers of God and extreme haters of God. But there will be no one who says there is no God. This is what awakens the Maranatha cry is the cry for deliverance. It's the cry for the king to come and establish righteousness in the earth. Guys, can't you long for the days where every nation 
All economic systems, governmental systems, every system in this world is brought underneath the leadership of Jesus. We want him to come make all the wrong things right. Uh, And we just want him closer. I want him to come home. So this is what happens in me when I'm reading, meditating on the Christmas story. I'm looking at Simeon and Anna going, God, you're going to do it again. And, and God has placed his hand on this community, I believe, to be a signpost in this region of this spirit. When we're talking about our values, when we're talking about the move of the Holy Spirit, when we're talking about the Maranatha cry, night and day prayer, when we're talking about all these things, holiness, generosity. These are the values that we live in and that we cultivate in our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Great glory and great darkness is coming. And we're going to be a mature church that comes forth and we're going to shine. The revelation of Jesus is going to touch us. I mean, think about Simeon talking at age 30, going, yeah. I mean, think about Anna. You get, your husband dies, you're 24 years old, and you got two decisions. Get remarried. She goes, you know what? I'm going to throw my life into prayer and fasting. You know, we call 84-year-old people like this cute. We call 24-year-olds. She made the decision at 20, in her 20s. We call them stupid. I believe he wants to anoint all of us with that longing for the coming king. He wants to put that. I believe he wants to increase the prophetic spirit. I believe the increase of dreams is coming. Here, just open up your hands. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel, who sits in lonely exile. If there's something I want all of you to know today, God fulfills his promises. I don't I don't know what you've heard from God, but I want you to know he's good on his word. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would move all over this room and for those that are watching. I just pray that you would move upon your people. I just want to give a chance for response, but you hear this message. And I believe he's anointing many in all kinds of walks of life with that Simeon and Anna grace and anointing but you say this is on the inside of me when I hear that hear you talk about these two something jumps on the inside of me and you're like I don't even know what that means but I just want to say yes tonight before the Lord if that made sense to you and something resonated on the inside of you when I was talking about that I want to invite you up here I want to pray for you